Welcome to the Movement Minutes with your host, Reed Nellis. Here, we pursue the human connection. We learn how to empower one another. We discuss clinical pearls. We discover our passions. We reflect on our capacity to achieve. We remain open to novel trends and concepts because regardless of our backgrounds or experiences, our successes or failures, we all speak the same language, human movement. We're back at it, back to another show. Today, I'm super excited to be talking to Jeff Langmaid. Dr. Jeff Langmaid is a man of many talents, speaker, author, founder, creator, just a big nerd. And we talk about that today of how being a nerd is cool. Diving into what you're interested in, in in research or clinical practice or snowboarding and photography and podcasts that we talk about today too, is actually really fun and relieving. Um, Upon all this nerddom of Jeff, again, cool nerd, cool, cool nerd, He has founded or created multiple platforms for chiropractors as well as other professionals, one of which is the Evidence-Based Chiropractor, which is automated marketing, more of a business-to-consumer sort of of marketing tactic, as well as the Smart Chiropractor, which is a networking tactic, more B2B or business-to-business, working with uh, referral sources from MDs, other chiropractors, local professionals around you. So with all of this, we get into great conversation of how to build a better practice and in turn build a better you as a provider or as a therapist or as a mover of any sort. So I hope you guys are as excited as I am to be talking to Jeff today and uh, let me know what you think about the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this. Without any further ado, let's get into it. Here's Jeff. All right, everybody, welcome back. So we just heard the formal introduction for Jeff, um, but I'll give him a chance to speak because I reached out to a few individuals who knew Jeff for know Jeff and spoke to Jeff in the past. Um, And I'm like, hey, do you guys have any good juicy stories that like I could bring up on this (laughs) podcast? And not a single person. So to name drop here a little bit, Capo, Allison Evans, MJ, went to school with you down in Palmer. Um, Mm -hmm. Every single person is like, no, like just a really good, honest dude. I'm like, well, that's boring. (laughs) He can't be that boring. (laughs) So um, we know you're a good, honest dude, Jeff, but tell us a little bit more about the the other side of Jeff, maybe the non-honest, the non-good. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if I can go that deep, but uh, how much time you have? Uh, yeah. So, um, I, I guess a little, a little bit of my history for anybody that uh, maybe hasn't hasn't heard my name before. Uh, I'm been a chiropractor, been a chiropractor about 15, 16 years. Graduated in 2006 from Palmer, Florida, uh, one of the first classes to graduate down there. And pretty much over the last like whatever x amount of years, uh, pretty much practiced in every way you can imagine. So, came out was an associate for a short amount of time. Uh, kind of my mentor that got me involved in chiropractic's mountain climber. He was, we, I lived, grew up in Rhode Island. He was going to summit Mount Everest. So I graduated in December, Everest climbing season for anybody that's into that stuff is like March to May ish. So worked in his practice for like three months with him. He went away for three months, managed the practice, sold doc 20 years in at the time. So good volume, good experience. Did that, uh, then had my own private practice, kind of a boutique cash-based practice, downtown Providence, 600 square feet. Um, and then made the move down to uh, Florida. I live in Tampa. That's where I'm we're chatting from today. Uh, and I joined a big multidisciplinary group. So at the time, like 10 years ago, I was probably one of like 20. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I want to say maybe one of 20 to 30 chiropractors in the world that were practicing in a traditional ortho group, 50 surgeons, 12 locations, chiefs of staff at all the hospitals, all that kind of stuff. And then I kind of got poached from there to join a super fast growing company at the time called Laser Spine Institute. They did uh, primarily uh, outpatient spine surgery. And I was tasked with really building the conservative care arm of that business. Practiced there for a few years, left. That company is now defunct. But when I left, I had been building and growing. Uh, if anybody has heard my name, it's probably through the evidence-based chiropractor or the smart chiropractor or chiro matchmakers companies that I was building, growing, developing, you know, working on pretty much since I started as a chiropractor in some various capacities. So uh, today, my day-to-day is mostly with evidence-based chiropractor, smart chiropractor, and uh, chiro matchmaker staffing business. So that's pretty much what I do, but that is the last 15 years, maybe in less than two and a half minutes. That is very good. How many times have you did that uh, whole background speech because that was I done a couple of times <laughs> sounded well refined right um but no as we heard in the uh intro speaker author founder creator and from the sounds of it I didn't know I'm glad you touched on all of that because you just hammered like 
every question I had for you for the day. So um, have a good one, Jeff. Nice to talk to you again. And uh, I guess we're done. No, um, but no, the speaker, author, founder, creator, that's, you can find that on Jeff's website and it's, it's true, but I didn't realize that you'd been doing that as dare we say a side hustle while you were an associate, while you were running your clinic, while you were doing all these other things. Um, what kind of led you to, or which one of the ones did you start first? Evidence-based, correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when you started that, what was kind of the internal seance with your brain of like, Hey man, we got to get this thing going and I should start leading this charge. What was kind of the conversation that you had with yourself there? So uh, the honest answer is like, I, when I p- chose the name, I, w- I was like, I, I can't, re- I wish I could remember what the other options uh, were, but it was, they were like, not accept- like, I didn't choose it to be like, you don't have your moleskin like- out that you have all your ideas on. Yeah, I, it's, I wish I did because <laughs> the other names were like, I just randomly basically chose that name, not like as any sort of statement or positioning or anything else. I just was like, ah, oh, this makes sense. Like, and the other stuff was just like, I don't know. It was like, uh, you know, next generation chiropractor. I don't know. Like, right, it was like, right. non, you know, it was like totally had nothing to do with how you practice this for that way. So, uh, but inevitably, I'm glad I chose the name I did. So, when I started it, um, it really was, there wasn't a really big master plan. So, my thing at the time was I was working in the first multidisciplinary group. And I was like figuring out how to get referrals from the other docs in the group for a variety of reasons. I couldn't really do external marketing because I was part of a big company and they had a marketing team, but they didn't really market for me. So it's kind of like I could just get whatever was coming in the front door, which is impossibly difficult to build. So I was like, well, I got to reach out to the other docs I work with, try to generate referrals. So when I started to do that and see a little bit of traction, I looked at the marketplace and I was like, damn, like I don't see anybody really teaching this sort of stuff. Um, and I think it's like super valuable. And then I started doing the same kind of marketing to other healthcare providers in my community, not just the docs I was working with and started to get a little bit of traction, a little bit of traction, made every error and you know, every wrong turn in the book along the way, but like kind of figured it out in a process. And I was like, oh, nobody else really has done this. And this is like a ridiculous, it's to me, it's the biggest missed opportunity for most docs practices is building referral relationships with other healthcare providers. Like who has your patients in their practice? Um, it doesn't have to be an MD doesn't have to be a DO, midwife, doula, you name it, whoever it might be. Mm -hmm. Um, And I saw an opportunity there. And like, at the time I was like, it would be great to create a product and like have a hundred dollars extra a month. Right. So it wasn't like this grand vision. Mailbox money. Awesome. I didn't collect email addresses on like my website for like two, like, you know, two years when I started it, like, you know, Facebook ads were like the cat's pajamas. Like you put in $1 and get out a billion. And now it's like, you put in $1 and you're lucky to get out one cent. So it was like, you know, all of that, essentially I saw a huge gap in the market. It wasn't really designed initially as a business, but more of like, oh, this is a great opportunity to kind of get out there. And I did have like, my other goal at the time was it'd be like, it'd be cool to do like some speaking and some stage appearances and do that sort of thing. But I didn't think it'd become my job. I just was like, Oh, like it'd be cool to do one or two. Like I'd be, it'd be, that would be interesting. Like, so it started literally as that, that was those for the seeds. But I mean, I think that's cool. Like you mentioned a lot of good things that any success self-help book will tell you, right. Of like failing a thousand times and learning from it and all that stuff. But like truly, and as cliche as this sound, like, Oh, you know, I, I think it'd be cool to speak. And I, I kind of have a passion. We were just talking off air about gear and snowboard and being passionate about like that kind of tangible stuff. Right. But like, as far as a career goes, you can make a career out of anything like that's right. speaking and doing whatever the hell you love. You can make a career out of that, which I think is awesome. And you're doing a hell of a job doing so. <laughs> um, yeah, so you. let's, let's backtrack a little bit for those who may not know Jeff Langmaid. Jeffrey, Dr. Jeffrey Langmaid, um, started with evidence-based chiropractor, then went on to create this marketing system and now business of the smart chiropractor and a bunch of other stuff in the between. But let's let's stick to those two for today's purposes, because otherwise we'd be here forever. Um, explain both of those projects and companies in elevator speech style. So let's start with evidence-based chiropractor. For those who may not know, what is the evidence-based chiropractor? Uh, the evidence-based uh, chiropractor. Do you, should I explain it as a platform or as a product? <laughs> uh, yes. 
<laughs> okay, so the uh, the evidence based chiropractor is a multimedia platform that services chiropractors with information. So we're on podcast, video, Facebook, anywhere where you can connect with people and have information. The evidence based chiropractor has a mouthpiece and an audience. And really, the goal of that is to help chiropractors better understand the science behind what they're doing. And then the product of that, so transitioning to that, is we help chiropractors with a step by step process build referral relationships with other healthcare providers in their community. Awesome. And I think so, like if, if I had to explain it, it would not be that illiterate or I, it would be <laughs> illiterate from me, not illiterate from you. Um, but no, like I, I not being a member purchaser of your product or, but following your platform very closely, like that is to a T exactly what it is. And I think the simplicity of how you describe that really describes the, I don't want to say the product, like demeaning what it is. Right. But like, it's just awesome stuff if you're a chiropractor or, or dare I say a provider of any realm like to follow and keep up on just to stay current, right? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go for it. No, go for it. I was going to switch gears. So you, you finish your thought. Oh, so uh, I would, yeah, I would agree. So it's, I probably work with like 98% chiros, but there is like 2%. Like relationship building, the, the strategies and tactics of relationship building, they don't, they're not border dependent. They're not provider dependent. It's like build trust and rapport, stay super consistent, you know, execute the tools in a systematic fashion, right? So the tools might change a little bit depending upon what kind of provider you are, but ultimately, you know, the system and process remains the same. And, you know, that that's one of the, the beauties of, of it as as well is, you know, I, you know, sort of not jokingly say, but I always say, you know, you run a Facebook ad, but when you turn it off, it stops working. You build a relationship, it can last an entire career. So it's a little bit more of an uphill climb to start, obviously, um, to, you know, to get the, to get traction with those relationships. But once you do, they can really produce fruit for years to come. And I, the other thing is I always tell chiropractors, cause they're like, what, what if you're this kind of chiropractor, that kind of, I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like it's about right. finding your dance partners, meaning like no matter what kind of chiropractor you are, there's probably some people in your community that like resonate with what you're doing and have right. your patients, quote unquote, your ideal patients in their practices. So that's where it's like, it's, it can be totally non-denominational. It's really just the, the rudiments, which nobody's taught and are really difficult to execute if you're trying to like figure it out. And systems and processes are what drive results, not like, oh, I think I'll, you know, ma like many people, it's like, oh, I thought about building relationships. That'd be a good idea. And you do like one thing and then right. you don't have anything to follow up or systems, you know, and that becomes a challenge. So anyway, that's- well, uh, no, I, I, that, and that's, like. Jeff, this is why I had you on the podcast was talking about this. So don't say anyway, like this is what we're here for today. Um, and I think one, one thing that you said there is, is really cool to me. And this is like my biggest challenge being a chiropractor, owning my own business and marketing for myself, or at least it was eight, eight years ago now when I started is not just finding dance partners. Like I look out into, so I purposely drive like the two minutes longer route to work every day because I cross more businesses and it kind of sparks my marketing mind of like, Hey, I should reach out to that person. Or I forgot to reach out to that person. And I start making mental notes of that, or not that I text and drive, but real notes of that, right, right. but not just finding the dance partners, but asking the damn girl or guy to dance. Like <laughs> that's one of the hardest parts that I think your steps, processes, systems, and that focus helps decrease the complexity of is giving you structure of not necessarily a script or something like that, as cheesy as that sometimes is, but right. works very well, um, yeah. is giving you an easier way to ask the girl to dance or ask that MD, ask the allopath, ask the acupuncturist that's next door to you um, just to go out to coffee or do whatever and build that relationship. So uh, that's correct. So you got to have frameworks. If you don't have frameworks, it's really, really difficult to get traction. Same thing as with care and treatment and practice, right? It's not necessarily one size fits all for everybody, but like as the healthcare provider, as the Cairo, you, you kind of know what you're doing. And when somebody comes in and you've been in practice a little while and somebody comes in with something going on, you kind of yeah. have a good clue initially of like, okay, here's the bucket they fall in. They might have some things that are, we do differently, but this is sort of how I know I get great results taking care of this. And I think the same thing as you're saying holds true with the relationships. It's not necessarily about it's actually the opposite of being right. robotically scripted but it is about having frameworks because it's like having a map like if you don't know the destination of where you're trying to get to 
And this is most of the time I see this happening when uh, when you go out and have conversations. So we talk about case notes, research, and meetings as the three pillars, but meetings are where things get real weird. Like, you know, people can just not send case notes or maybe they 99.9% don't send updates so they don't stay consistent, but meetings are where, where everything gets real weird because people go in, it's like, you know, I can't wait to tell this other person everything they never wanted to know about chiropractic. Like, right. I hope that works. Hey, it's like, you know, yeah. and, you know, or, or you go in and you're like, you know, I, I I'm introverted by nature. So it's like, I'm like, it's not like my comfort zone. And then like, for me, it would be like not having a system and process. I'm like meandering, but then I see other docs that are then like overly, you know, falsely confident right. and that comes off. Like, you know, so it's like, it's, so when I looked at that, I said, okay, well, through trial and heartache, you know, how do you make this something that whether you're super introverted or you're super extroverted, it can work. And as my uh, business partner, Jason, would always say, it's like, you know, the answer is in questions. So it was really, that's where we developed the frameworks around here's questions you can ask to uncover. So, so it takes the pressure off. You don't need to like lead the conversation about all these chiropractic nuance or, you know, whatever, insert your profession here, nuance but what are these high impact questions that you can ask that uncover more about that other provider's practice that enable you then to be spe more specific with your unique selling proposition, your answers, however you want to say that, so that it makes way more linear sense for them to refer that first patient because until, you know, before they refer a hundred, they have to refer one. So it's really trying to get down to, okay, what are, how can I, you know, reduce friction? How can I build trust and rapport? How can I kind of put gasoline on the fire of my case notes and research with a meeting and not have it be like a total train wreck where like, I'm, you know, I'm either off the rails or not saying enough. And that's where asking some very specific questions can come in very, very handy because it starts to provide you with information that you'd never have otherwise. Right. And I think the question being the answer is one of my favorite kind of like concepts and ideas, stoicism 101. Um, <laughs> but like the, the, any relationship, whether it's your spouse, your parents, or a, a medical doctor down the street or whatever it is, nobody likes a relationship where the other person's always right. And so That's asking right. questions and allowing both people to be right uh, just helps foster that relationship and like it could be something that like one of the biggest things that I do for marketing is, Hey, let's go grab a beer down at Excelsior Brewing Company, which your EBC, the Excelsior Brewing Company is the same thing. And it always throws me off. I'm like, wait, who's posting here. But, um, <laughs> I'm always like, God, Jeff's down at Excelsior Brewing Company. Awesome. <laughs> um, but no, it, it's like just being human first, which is one of our tenants with the podcast here is like, everybody's human. And they all put their pants on the same way and all that stuff. And, we all pay taxes sometimes. Um, like all that <laughs> stuff is really true when it comes down to these meetings. So let's switch gears. Let's talk about the smart chiropractor. And as yep. I chatted with you at the last time we saw each other in person at, I think it was Atlanta. Um, yep. I've been in too many places. Um, it's kind of a one hand washes the other sort of thing. So tell us the elevator pitch on a smart chiropractor. Yeah, so Smart Chiropractor is uh, similar to uh, the evidence-based chiropractor where it's a platform. I like to say it's a, but it's a platform that has a blog, it has a podcast, it has videos, it has all of those items, but it's a little bit more focused on the intersection of research and marketing. So while this, uh, the evidence-based chiropractor is really focused B2B, business to business, building referral relationships, the Smart Chiropractor is the other side of that coin. It's B2C, business to consumer or customer. So it's more public facing. So the tools and the, and the tools are completely different. There's like no overlap, like how we teach to reach out to other healthcare professionals. The systems and strategies are hundred percent different than how we go through and reach out to the public, but within the smart chiropractor is a little bit more the ele elevator pitch, but the smart chiropractor is really about, you know, guiding a patient journey, you know, from potential patient to active patient to what we call a proactive patient and, and, you know, essentially generating more new patients improving active care retention and having more reactivations through what we have our pillars over there, which our pillars are social media automation. Our pill, That's one pillar. The other pillar is email. And the third pillar is patient education. So we execute those through monthly campaigns, weekly topics, and daily posts. So we create all of the content for our docs, and then we automate it through all of those primary platforms and social is like Facebook, Instagram, Google business, YouTube, that's, you know, we're a little wide and how we deem social email obviously is email marketing. So 
weekly email newsletters, HSA, FSA campaigns at the end of the year, happy birthday camp, you, you name it. It's all automated, all personalized for the practice. And then the patient education is like video streaming, patient handouts, all that kind of stuff. All that's automated and changes with the monthly campaigns. So that's awesome. I think like any profession, whether you're a chiropractor listening or an athletic trainer, a massage therapist, like there's people like Jeff out there who say they can get you the same thing. Like I've seen the product, I've gone through a myriad of these kind of things. Like this is different and you don't need to hear this, Jeff. I'm just patting your back here, but um, that automated content is different. Like it's not your classic cheesy, happy Valentine's day, like chiropractic pun joke in there, which I mean, there's, there's a couple of puns. I just, I was on your website earlier this morning and it's price adjustment, pun intended kind of thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, super funny. Um, so there are some puns in there, but no, the marketing content is different. What I want to ask you though, Jeff is not how is yours better or anything like that. But let's say I primarily work with athletes. I'm, I wouldn't call myself a sports chiropractor, but I see everybody as athlete. My office and clinic is pretty much a gym space. How does your content, like you were talking about the evidence-based chiropractor being non-denominational with the yeah. smart chiropractor and the B2C marketing content, does that fit for a family general practice versus geriatrics versus pediatrics versus sports chiropractic versus the gamut or kind of tell us more about that? Yeah, great question. It's probably about the 80-20 rule. And, and maybe it might even be 90-10. So for most practices, our campaigns are going to hit the mark. So uh, how do we figure out our campaigns? We, we figure out our campaigns. I strategize our campaigns in the third quarter of every year for the for the next year. And we're like five or six years in. So we've, we've been doing it a little while. So um, basically what I look at template. is... The, yeah. And it's like the monthly campaigns are based upon what, what are people searching for, which does change right year to year a little bit. So there's some dynamics there, but what are people searching for online that a chiropractor can be the source of information, the answer, you know, et cetera. So we're looking at what are the highly searched topics that are relative and relevant to chiropractors. Then we're looking at what have we done over the last year, right? So it's not a you know direct repeat because we want some very, you know, variation freshness. And then we look at, in terms of um, you know staying away from the edges, so we don't mm -hmm. like it's non-technique specific, uh, and and that's really how we go about it. So. Every year we have a month dedicated to low back. Every year we have a sports month. Every year we have a cervical spine month and a headache month because those are perennially highly searched topics relative to chiropractic, but then others we might switch in and out. Now, for practices that are super, super specific, when I say 80, 20, 90, 10, there are a certain thin percentage of practices that maybe I'm making it up, but maybe they're focused like spinal decompression, personal injury and neuropathy. And that's like all they do, right? Mm -hmm. Those individuals we would have on our custom content. So our core content is everything that we automate all the monthly campaigns, but we do have like a premier level of service that's called custom content where we will, the doc can choose six campaigns from our library previously done months. And then we will custom craft and create for them six campaigns so half of the year relative to the specific niches of their practice. So we've had a couple of docs that are in the North, uh, North Midwest, I guess, kind of probably, yeah. probably near you uh, that were like so hockey Canada. and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like hockey and stuff like that were big, like hockey and figure skating. They're like, we like that. We, we like 40% of our practice is that. So that we created a couple months of custom content. So for 80 to 90% of practices are core campaigns are going to nail it because they're non-denominational technique or practice style. It's really about movement. It's about benefits. And it's more, it's less about, look at me, I'm the chiropractor and more about, you know, here's how you can better, here's how you can reach your goals. Here's the benefits of what can be provided. So it's benefit more than feature focused, of course. Um, and then uh, for those practices that have really, really niche topics, and most of the time, those niche topics are also going to be big rep. Most people that do spinal decompression, that's a big revenue generator for the yeah. practice. So having custom content relevant to that is worth its weight in gold. But if you don't yeah. have these specific you know, care plans and packages, uh, then I would recommend for most docs, uh, the core is going to be a nail on all the marks that you want to get. Well, I think, again, not to make your head getting bigger and it's not big already but um <laughs> not to pat your back and toot your horn even more but like i, I love chatting with you about this because you understand like hey we could just focus on the 80 percent or the 90 percent and make that damn good which you already did 
but you can still cater and specifically customize for the 10% or 20%. Um, AKA you have no stone left unturned of chiropractors that could utilize your products and platforms. Right. Um, that being Gold. said, what's that? That's the goal. <laughs> well, I mean, there's two different ways to think about a business or a concept in general, right? Is do I focus on, I was talking to my niece the other day about this. She's like, well, she plays volleyball. It's like, well, I suck at passing. So I'm never going to play in the back. I'm like, you're 13. Like you can get better at passing. You're going to have to pass in the front row eventually. Like, do you focus on the things that you're good at and keep getting better at the good things? Or do you focus on the, if you have a select amount of time or effort or money or whatever it is, do you focus on the things that you're not so good at? So you can kind of reach more of a jack of all trades, broad overarching thing. And it's, it's a battle with any concept or business, but it's, it's difficult. And to be honest with you, when we first started looking at this smart chiropractor and we started first started building and developing it five, six years ago, we, um, we originally were really into the idea of basically having cu custom content from the get go and a doc could choose and turn, but like the complexity of that was like so insane that um, it's taken us, you know, five years to be able to offer it. So, you know, we started with our core service and it's gotten great results over a half decade, but we started with that, you know, from just a production, you know, it just made it way more, we could lower the price to, so it's affordable for any doc that really wants to do it. And also to kind of build out uh, our team. So, you know, that's the other thing. When we started the smart chiropractor, there was really three of us. Now we have a team of, it depends on how you count exactly <laughs> who does what, but we, we have somewhere between 10 to 12 full-time people working on the smart chiropractor, all remote, all spread throughout the country. So as we built out our team, it's given us the opportunity, just like a practice, right? You know, as you yeah. build out that team, you start to be able to leverage your time, leverage your expertise in other ways. So it was really just this past, this, this year, actually, uh, in 2021, uh, that uh, last few days of it, that we initially launched our custom content uh, opportunity, really only for an upgrade for our core members. So we haven't even released it, you know, kind of publicly yet at all. Mm -hmm. We just gave our core members the opportunity to sort of upgrade if they if they chose so in 2022 uh we probably will be doing more of an external i'm going to say launch or, you know open enrollment however you want to say probably start talking about it a lot more because now we've really have the system and process dialed in um and also with smart chiropractor we launched with our members over the last few months e-commerce so that's another area that we're moving really really aggressively into in in 2022 is helping our docs be able to click create uh, monthly recurring revenue uh, automatically uh, because we're able to you know promote for them because we already you know manage their social their email all of those things you, you know now when they have a store we're able to really help with the sales and marketing and promotion of what they have in their store automatically so they don't have to do anything so that's an area that we're also really excited about diving into yeah a bunch of cool things to talk about there but i it's funny you brought up the shop section of things because i was looking at your website i don't know last week when we confirmed this and i was like he's got a shop i'm like yeah i suppose he has t-shirts and i start looking through everything that's on there i'm like there's a lot more retail resale things that we could be utilizing i think i mean i'm a huge advocate for everybody in the world i think should start a small business like whether it's mm -hmm some little passion project or something on the side, just something you work on two hours a week or 20 hours a week or 80 hours a week. But just that real life monopoly aspect is interesting because you forget how many things or you don't know how many things are missing like a e-commerce site until you see it. And it's just monthly recurring revenue. Um, one thing you mentioned there is, well, A, this podcast isn't getting released until 2022. So for those listening right now, you just heard hopefully the first kind of like, out public outreach, not to the core members, but uh, yeah. maybe they'll maybe this is like breaking news. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, but anyways, it's not getting released for a couple of weeks. Second is that custom package idea. Did you ever think about the risk of like, and this might be three years ago or when you began this project of me read picking like, all right, I want this one, this one, this one, and this one, like 12 of them, right? I want all these packages. Well, they're all about the knee or they're all about headaches or they're all about this and that. And then people having adverse results because they picked bad product or bad content, right? Or duplicate content. Does that kind of, I mean, you said it goes into your planning with month to month programming. Right. So you don't overlap anything, but is that something you foresee happening at all or have seen in the past with the custom content is it's just too similar? It's a great question. Um, we haven't seen that to date. And, and 
in many cases, the reason is, is I think a multi, multi-fold answer. One is that we like meticulously track our data daily. So for instance, you know, via social, we reach through our members, like 5 million people, I think. And we send like 600,000 email a month. And we send about 600,000 emails per month. We reach about half a million on, Go- on Google business, et cetera. So we can split down all the channels and really track performance literally day in and day out. So yeah. we know when something's like hitting or when something's not hitting, basically. And I say hitting, meaning like engagement stats, click through right. rates, whatever it might be for the applicable platform. We track that and then monitor that and then look at it monthly as a team to ensure that we're, you know, obviously we want to be doing better each month, but not necessarily right. you know, just kind of cruising along. So our members continually get better results. Second part about it is on the, our custom content members. I always have a quick phone call with them. Um, you know, and again, we've only launched it internally. So it was, it's been an exploratory process, but it's really about, Hey, what's your practice? Like, like when I hop on the call, I'm just like, what are you into? Like, what's your practice like? And I hopped on a phone with a couple of people this past year. And they kind of told me, and I was like, I think you just just stay with core. Like, I don't think you're going to get that much. Like your practice is like, sounds like you're doing well with what you have. And if you're not telling me you have some other niche specific thing that you really want to get after, you know, that then your core is probably going to suffice and be great for you. So it, it, it does depend. So I haven't had to sway anybody off of something like nobody yeah. said anything wild on a custom content call where I was like, oh, you shouldn't do that. Um, but there were a couple where I, where I felt as though core still would be getting them the, the best ROI, you know, dollar for dollar, um, you know, compared to the custom. So those are, the, that's really, you know, I'd say sort of how we track it. The, the other component of it is, you know, the whole system is built on the philosophy of teach and invite consistently, uh, teach, you know, showcase something. Every time you put out a piece of content or send an email, whatever, teach something and educational, engaging, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, and then invite, right. That's a call to action, right. Invite somebody to take a next step and do it super consistently. And for so many docs out there, they just have zero structure, right? It's just like, it's like, you know, it's put off until the last thing or there's in the lack of consistency or lack of professional. So it's like, we, we bet a little, you know, we're a little bit fortunate because we built this out over such a, a long amount of time. And we have a team that all, all of us are professionals at what we do that like, you know, the marketplace, you know, when we layer on it, it, it pretty much always works <laughs> because right. most of the docs we work with, like weren't doing that much to begin with, et cetera. And that's the point is that this is what gives them that foundation. And then we give docs of additional scripts and things like that. If they're like go-getters and they want to start, like start doing video and things like that. We always say, Hey, the smart chiropractor is like the foundation of everything. And then you can build on that if you want, but yeah. you know, you have to have that foundation set. You have to be able to teach and invite consistently across the most popular platforms with the campaigns and topics and subjects that people want to hear about your ideal patients want to hear about so that then you can start doing those other things and really amplify your results. If you want to go get, if you don't want to, and you just want to have the you know delegated automations, cool. Like it, it works, but right. it just depends. You can choose your own adventure. It's like the smart chiropractor is the building blocks. And then the smartest chiropractor is whatever they do on top of that. Right. That's right. (laughs) Um, No, I think you mentioned, you mentioned a great point. Like I love, again, we were talking earlier about gear and stuff like that. Like I am definitely a jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing. I love the marketing aspect. I love managing and building my own website. I love creating my own newsletters and stuff like that. But one of the things that I'm horrible at is consistency. And so like, this is something that I've looked into and this is selfishly why I have you on the podcast because this is basically like a Jeff, sell me on this thing. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's like, I, I love creating my own stuff, but hearing what you just said gives people like me at least that freedom to say, it's not like you hand over your social password and all of a sudden Jeff's doing everything on your social media marketing platforms. Like it, you still get to do all your own stuff, right? Um, and I think that's that's huge. It creates the uniqueness and the, uh, genuine human interaction because I'm different than the chiropractor down the street and stuff like that. But awesome. Um, switching gears a little bit. What do you think you went to chiropractic school, your chiropractor, um, try not to answer this as selfishly as possible, as far as like marketing and stuff like that. Uh, but what do you think the biggest missing link is from chiropractic school right now and what the students are coming out as? Just business acumen. Uh, I think, you know, just the ability to understand how to build and, and grow a business, I think is, 
is is just sor- sorely lacking. So uh, marketing is a component of that, but I think there's more to it. it you know, there certainly is uh, much, much more to it in terms of, you know, and anything from understanding contracts to understanding what the available opportunities are to then understanding to based upon what you want to do, how to sort of execute on that and how to, and, and how to be able to make that a reality. So I would say, you know, business acumen is, is the, is the number one issue, you know, that, I, that I see. And, and some of that, I also will say, I can be very, very critical of, uh, you know, of, of the schools and I, 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 I am privately, uh, but, uh, but, but the one thing I will say, and this is a really important component. And we see this with the staffing company and Cairo matchmakers that, about 80% of people who go into chiropractic school, roughing the numbers, but about 80% are what we call caregivers. They're not business builders or entrepreneurs, and that's a continuum, right? Caregiver on one end of the continuum, entrepreneur on the other, and a business builder in the middle. Um, and most people that want to become chiropractors love, t- it's awesome, like love taking care of people. They want to take care of people. They just want to be paid fairly to take care of people day in and day out. And they don't really love and want to, they're not trying to build the next chiropractic empire. They want to be able to just t- be, deliver care. They're caregivers. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword where it's like, and no matter what school it is, like Wharton Business School is not going to turn uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody who's non-entrepreneurial into an entrepreneur, it just so happens most many entrepreneurs go to Wharton business school and then, you know, then the self, you know, self-fulfilling. So the yeah. chiropractic schools, they are in a little bit of a dicey situation because I think they do a pretty good job, you know, showing you the basics of how to take care of patients safely and effectively. Right. So, you know, that, and that's really their core business. But the second aspect of that, because we don't have the infrastructure of PT, et cetera, where you can just go get a job at 85K, 100K, like right off the bat, there's mm-hmm. like this weird component that is the business side, which I think the schools have a responsibility to help with, but it's not really their responsibility. So it ends up being a pretty dicey situation. Um, I just think that there could be more um, tools. I'm not advocating for more classes, quote unquote, Yeah, uh, you know, just talking about business, but I think there's really something for just having a little bit more modernized approach to the tools to help guide people or even just to self-identify with somebody that's, you know, and, and people can change and evolve and everything else, but that, Hey, it's okay to be like, here's how you can, and can think about who you are based. And I mean, these are very standardized assessments that people can take and understand where they're at. And it just would inform things because we see that most of the challenges that happen after school are mismatch. An entrepreneur who's building a chiropractic practice hires a caregiver, wants them to be an entrepreneur building the business yep. and the compensation structure is misaligned. The, everything is misaligned. And guess what? Then you end up with quote unquote chiropractors, eat their young, et cetera. A lot of it is in a lack of definition of, of who you are, quote unquote, that leads to a mismatch. And that's one of the greatest challenges. So I think if the schools really helped people, if I refine it a little bit more be, to be more specific, there's business acumen. If the schools would help docs I'll maybe a little bit better understand who they are and what they want to do, which is challenging and non-perfect, uh, especially when you're in school and you're trying to still figure it out. Uh, I and think it would help, and all that. Yeah, I think it would help s- streamline the processes a little bit and lead to a little bit less heartache for a lot of docs feeling like they get burned on their first two or three, you know, go around. So, um, so that would be my answer. No, and that was as you probably assumed and answered, like, it's a loaded question, right? Like I knew you were going to say business. I knew you're going to say the schools can't really do much about it, nor should they add more business classes. But what I wanted to get as a second follow-up question then is Mm -hmm. not necessarily, is that the school's problem, but um, is that even something that aside from, I totally agree. Like the personality assessment side of thing is something I think the students should do even before they question going into any grad school is like, are you, cause I was speaking to my own situation. Like, I was a caregiver, 100% using your terms, right? I wanted to make the world a better place and rub people's backs and do all the chiropractic cool stuff, right? I didn't want to do all of the, the admin side of things. Then after I graduated, got my teeth kicked in a few times and learned from my mistakes, I'm like, you know what? When I was six, I was mowing all the yards in my neighborhood. Like, I do have an entrepreneurship mindset. It just right. wasn't. It was completely aside, like, from the marketing strategies and the hanging mailers on every person in your neighborhood's door. Like it was not what they taught us in business class in school. So everything that I was learning about business, it just didn't fit me in my personality. 
So I kind of went through exactly like what you're saying, but it was unfortunately three years after I graduated. So now I understand where I'm good at marketing and where my strengths and weaknesses are. But the moral of this question or the basis of this question is, is that something that do you think the schools, given all the time, money, resources, would even be capable of doing to teach these students the business acumen that's necessary? Or is that something that has to come with time and repetition and failure in the real world? I think there's some of both. So now, obviously there's a massive amount of complexities that are far beyond what I understand in terms of what the schools have to do to meet eligibility requirements and how much time you have in a day and budgets and right, you know, all of those things are, yep. you know, it's, you know, so it's a little bit of pie in the sky to just sort of ig ignore all of that, which are just realities of running a business, which is the school. Um, but I, I do they, think that there they could are be... a for-profit company. What do you mean? What? <laughs> That's why I paid them $250,000. That's for sure. I, I, th <laughs> I think that there is an opportunity inevitably to, to sort of modernize the approach. I think if you probably went back and, you know, asked, you know, every uh, student over the last 10 years, hey, do you think you're ad adequately prepared? You probably would get, you know, the only people that would say yes would be, be purebred entrepreneurs who are going to be all set one way or the other. I think that they're just not doing as good of a job as they could supporting, you know, the business builders who can become entrepreneurs, the caregivers who can move through a business builder and become, an, you know, so I, I think that there's, there's more that can be done and specifically sort of modernizing that experience because as you described, a lot of what's being taught is sort of really old fashioned. Um, and some of that's great stuff like foundational tenants, uh, but some of it is just so dated, it's not realistic to the marketplace. And I think that there could be and should be a, a, a re-emphasis, a re-look at that. And that's a Herculean effort to sort of install oh, yeah. across the system. I totally get that. Um, but I think it would be super beneficial. And it's not going to cure all ills, as you said, right? You know, so it's certainly you're going to end up still with, uh, you know, people that struggle and have to find their way and, and that sort of thing. That's an inevitable inevitability. And it's not the school's responsibility to necessarily create a marketplace, um, mm -hmm. you know, of job opportunities. But I do think it, it is the school's responsibility to understand what the marketplace looks like and then best prepare the individuals. And I think it's pretty clear at this point over the last 30 years, the amount of caregivers is graduating and that you know get miss you know round peg square hole into you know business builder and entrepreneur type associateships is like yeah, yeah no pun intended you know it's like epidemic and pandemic right this happens all the time and i've heard the stats you know that 50% of chiropractors are not in active practice after 5 years and i just I, I mean and i think every organization denies that but i'm like how is there 55,000 practicing chiropractors and like a thousand graduating a year for the last hundred and something years, there should be like 250,000 chiropractors. Right. So very clearly there's a pretty high amount of churn early on. And I think that that's just a shame because every, the world needs what we do. So it's like, right. I just view it as like, ah, oh, that just, that, that sucks because I view that as like, that's a person who would deliver hands-on conservative care, help people avoid surgical intervention, potentially avoid any, any drugs, you know, and, and be able to do that in a community. And when that's lost, people in that community inevitably get pushed down through, however you want to say it, a medical model, which might yeah. not yield the best result for them long-term or what they desire. And that's such just a missed opportunity. So uh, not to be like hoity-toity and like, you know, no, all, you know like a, mean, it's a vision with it. But I think it's, I just view that as like a, such a practical reality, especially after working in surgery companies and seeing people come in so confused, so bad, you know, such bad information and everything else. It's like, Ah, oh, that's just yeah. such, such a well, and like killer. you touched on this, but like it, the people who are dropping out after five years or no longer in practice after five years are the caregivers who, that's like, right. I mean, I, I know many people that I graduated with that were really good at adjusting, really good with their soft skills, but had zero entrepreneurship ability. Right. And it's like they would have been great providers. They that's right. Somebody else to manage the business, like Jeff and marketing and <laughs> stuff. But all right, I want to keep you on time here and respect your uh, your schedule. So let's get to the uh, surprise questions. I gave you a forewarning about these questions, but I didn't tell you what they were. So these yeah. three questions again are questions we ask every guest on the podcast. Um, so we'll, we'll hit it. If you could be ranked top ten in the world at something, what would it be and why? Hmm, oh, that is a really good one. Uh, I would the say only kind of questions I, I ask, man. <laughs> Rank top 10 in the world. Uh, I'm going to go with either uh, you know, table tennis ping pong player or snowboarder. 
So I say table tennis and ping pong because I like really like playing ping pong and there's like such a ludicrously low ratio of getting hurt or injured doing it, but that would be like pretty cool. Um, And you get travel all over, uh, you know, Europe and Asia where it's more popular than the United States would be like super cool. Um, And it's like sort of weird and off kilter, which I always, uh, I like that as well. Um, And uh, the second answer to that would probably be uh, snowboard. I've always been a skateboarder, surfer, snowboarder. I'm the most competent at snowboarding. So th- that would be, that would be great. My only hesitation on answering that with that specifically is I see what the people like the top guys and gals are doing right now. And it's like, so mind blowing to me that I'm like, I don't actually know if I'd want to do right. that. Like, <laughs> So I was expecting you to say snowboarding, by the way. Um, ping pong is interesting. I think it's funny that you're using ping pong as a vehicle, basically like I just want to be good at ping pong. So I get to travel and do all the other cool shit that's associated with ping pong table tennis. Um, I will deny though, you can get hurt. Cause I just got a nice scratch from Christmas playing ping pong against my brother, brother-in-law. Um, so, you, I, you know, I got a boo-boo Jeff um, <laughs> snowboarding on the other hand. So I grew up as a competitive snowboarder and when I hung up my boots and I still ride every now and then now I'm a skier, I've, I've changed ways. Um, gotcha. but I still ride. And, like I could probably still throw a double if I had to, but like, when I started seeing kids that I know and like that I would compete against starting throwing triples and quads and stuff, I'm like, I don't, I, I could probably do that, but I don't know if I could pun not intended, like wrap my head around it. Like, I don't know if I want to risk that much at, I think I was 19 when I stopped competing. Like I'm already kind of on the way out. Like these kids are 16, 17. I, I can't do that anymore. So funny. I would, um, I'd agree. I'm like a, I'm like a, uh, I know that this guy still goes like really big, but I, I, you know, I'm really into like a mellow version of like Travis Rice. Like if I could just free ride back country, yeah. I mean, he goes off, but he's like, he's getting older, right? He like won the competitions yeah, early 2000s. Chilling. Now he's a little older, but he's, he just, you know, unbelievably technical and complex terrain. Um, that that's like super, super interesting well, to me. It's funny. You said Travis, I was expecting you to say Terry J Hawkinson, but, and that's, yeah. that'd be like my go-to, like if I could perfect somebody's style and just emulate them, it'd be Terry J. But, um, next question here, what's one thing, you know, you can do better at in life practice, anything and aspire to learn within the next year. Um, uh, speaking, speaking from stage. Um, I think that I do a good job, but I, I, there's significant room for improvement, especially when I see people that I just think are really good at it. Um, and, and I, and that's some, an area that I'd constantly like to improve. And I think it's realistic to get the reps in over the next year and, and sort of continue to improve. So that, that would be my answer. When I think you're like, I'm very much an introvert unless I'm in a situation where I get to be an extrovert, then I'm a great extrovert kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not necessarily an introverted extrovert. It's just in my own space, I get to become an extrovert like here. Yep. Um, and that's something I am challenged with as well as like, how do I turn that on the second I get on that stage versus get a little warm up, drop some dad jokes. see where <laughs> <I'm at. laughs> All right. Now I'm in my zone, but <laughs> Last one for you. What's one actionable step you would advocate for listeners to take better care of their relationships, their health, their movement, and their lives? Something um, they can do in the next day, once a day, once a month. That is another, that's an, that's, that, that is a tough one. There's so many different directions to go. Um, I would say uh, commit to reading a book a month. Um, and I think that the book, many books can provide the strategies, the playbooks, the inspiration you need to take action. And I I think, you know, my best and most creative times are always when I really block out time in the morning, you know, to, to read and then time in the evening to read. And I find, you know, it's like you get somebody, you know, sells a million dollar coaching program and they distill all that knowledge down into a $20 book. Uh, and most of us just walk by all day, every day, you know, and don't spend the time. So I, I would say whether it is relationships, personal, professional, whether it is uh, health overall, or whether it's trying to you know build, grow and develop business skills, I would say that, you know, you can, you, you can find books and resources that are really, really good. Now you can probably find them used on Amazon for five or six bucks delivered. I buy that sometimes a lot too, because I read so much. Um, but I, I would say that, uh, I try to get through at least one uh, book a week or more, but I would say if you're not accustomed to that, just say, hey, f- you know, for this year, I'm going to try to do one book a month. And uh, I'd be shocked if, 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 if at the end of the year, 
you didn't have um, you didn't have a positive momentum because the right book can be so inspirational to take action. It also can be so uh, mind expanding to say, oh, I hadn't thought about it that way, even though I heard it this way in a video, even though I saw this, that or the other thing. Uh, the right book at the right moment is one of the most powerful things that I've ever experienced in my life. And I can say that most of what um most of where I'm at today is a direct reflection of the amount of time I put in, you know, in, in that study and specifically relative for sure to the marketing, et cetera. And I think it extends to the research as well. When you spend that amount of time, just really sinking your teeth in with the written word, quote unquote, yeah. uh, it really is different. Uh, I love watching videos. I love creating videos. I love listening as well, but there is something to you know, the, the visual component of it. And I'm, I'm, I'll go, I'll go total ham on this. I'm going over the end of the diving board. I would say, and if you're willing to go physical, I'm physical book only no Kindle, yeah. no. And all I do is physical. So I'm, if you're willing to, to do that as well, I do believe that there is additional positive benefit to that. And it's probably negligible if you're just getting started, but consider buying a physical book in the next, uh, in the next day. But like, I'm a huge physical person. Like I take, I'm currently writing physical notes. All my patient notes are physical before I put them into that. So I totally agree with that. Um, I think there's another aspect of reading a physical book, especially not while you're driving with an audio book, not a Kindle with blue light and all that fun stuff. Um, but it gives you time to kind of space out like, yeah, you're paying attention to the book and you're thinking and creating in your own brain, but some of your best, at least for me, some of my best ideas come either while I'm reading after I'm done reading for 30, 45 minutes, like you get done and you just feel not inspired, all cliche, like, but you're left to your own devices and kind of melting into your own brain a little bit. And that's a beautiful place, right? As scary and dark as it can be sometimes, but it's a beautiful place. <laughs> um, that's great. funny story, but I jumped in the car with a buddy of mine, I don't know, a month and a half ago. And all of, I could hear something talking about like this and it was just talking so fast. I'm like, what are you listening to? It's like audiobook. I'm like, why does it sound like this? And he's like, I have it on four times speed. I'm like, do you even understand what they're talking about? He goes, ah, it's kind of like osmosis. I'm like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> like, you have no I'm idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you're just spacing out and driving around. He goes, yeah, but I don't know. Then I get to say I read two books this week. I'm like, you didn't read any books. You listen to <laughs> books on four times speed. Um, for all I know, they were picture books too. So uh, last thing, just uh, before I say goodbye, do you got one or two or three good books that you'd you'd recommend for somebody listening Ooh, specifically that's a great about question. business marketing uh what we're talking yeah about. so um so uh, uh if i butcher some of the titles here i apologize so uh think and grow rich by napoleon hill classic mm -hmm. you know self-help mm -hmm. book whatever you want to say but it's all about you know money positive thinking etc uh, i i think that that's an absolute uh, tenant uh, of any of anything there's a paul arden book called it's not how uh great you great you not are. how good you I are it's how great you want to be yeah it's super so it's, small it's yeah, super it's desk, easy it's to read white, cool gold letters looks great on the front desk that's right uh yeah. I, I i'm a huge fan of uh i'm a huge fan of that paul arden book and then if i went with a, a third one i'm kind of looking over um this might this is a little bit of a wild card uh, but mark echo the fashion designer uh he wrote a book called unlabel like 15 years ago and for whatever reason at the time that i read it this is probably an off kilter one that won't resonate with everybody but like for some reason like i got really into that when when he released it and there just was it just spoke to me again in that right way about like marketing and business and like it just sort of got me some momentum going even though you know the you know clothing industry is wildly different really than anything that i'm involved in it just was written in a way that that struck me so the two books that i'd say everybody has to have in their collection is napoleon hill think and grow rich i would say the paul arden book is, is an absolute must have uh there's a variety of different directions i could go as well with seth godin and simon sedek and gary vaynerchuk's early Glad books specifically well and, yeah um but uh but those would be the three that i would choose i think the mark echo book is, is is a cool wild card that might stimulate the next great idea from somebody out there I love it, but I'm a little disappointed because I've read two out of those three and I'm not as smart as you. So <laughs> you um, but no, I think the, to keep us on schedule, but uh, the idea of learning something about business and marketing and success from somebody who's not in your wheelhouse is actually really cool. Like one of my greatest mentors in business is actually running a landscape business. Like his business and my business have nothing to do with one another. 
but it's still a service right. industry and that's, that's right. It's, it's the same. So, well, sir, thank you for taking your time out of your day. I hope you're staying nice and warm there in Tampa. I'm a little jealous, but, uh, <laughs> um, I appreciate it truly. Maybe we'll have you on for a, a part two and we'll talk about snowboarding and video camera gear again, but, um, be awesome. yeah. Anything else you want to say before you take off? Uh, I just would say thank you for having me on. I, I, I would encourage everybody that, you know, that's listening, like podcasts are also just a great way. So, you know, subscribe to the show. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you, a, you know, a, a shout out. I think, you know, subscribe to the show, give feedback. That That's really important, I think, as a podcaster myself. So I'd encourage everybody listening, you know, to the show, give some feedback. You know, that helps more people find out about this podcast and like stay subscribed and listen in, like staying connected to, uh, you know, individuals who are, you know, interviewing people, bringing on new ideas, I think is always just a, a great thing to do. So uh, if anybody has questions for me, they can always reach me, Jeff, at the evidence based chiropractor.com or across any of the, the, the properties online. Um, but um, I'd say, you know, everything takes longer. My, my big thing, I, I think, over the past six months is. Um, you know, everything takes longer than you want it to. So if you're, if you're listening out there and you're like, gosh, I, you know, I'm struggling, I'm trying to get to the next level, whatever that might be. And it's just not working. Um, you know, look at what your options are, you know, results, follow actions, take the action steps today to get the results you want tomorrow. If you don't take any action steps, you're never going to get those results. So, you know, pay attention to podcasts like this, you know, tune into you know, the people that you resonate with that you feel like you can learn from take an action step today, even if it's just a little one and those things add up over time to ultimately get the results that you want, but don't get discouraged along the way. I think all of us, you know, want the results and we want to have things happen and it nearly always takes longer and is more complicated than, than, than we want it to be. Uh, and most of us know that deep down, especially if we've been in the, in, in the business for a little while, but, uh, I think it's always a good reminder because I can always find myself still frustrated with those things. So I try to remind myself of that and I would encourage everybody else, uh, just keep getting one foot in front of the other, reach out to people, ask for help, ask questions, um, and take the action steps that you think you should take. Uh, and it's a sorting out and feeling out process, but just taking the action step itself starts to clear off the map. It starts to showcase the path and it can lead you to the results of whatever that is that you want, but uh, it's all a process. I love it. Now I'm ready to run through a brick wall, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, have a great rest of your day, sir. And uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you. Thank you.